Thanks so much for, for the kind introduction and the opportunity to talk at the Review Academy. And so today I'll be sharing our recent work on the sequence modeling of multi-scale three genome organization. So before I start, so I actually have a small advertisement here because we are starting a new graduate program in UT Southwestern about computational biology. So if you are someone applying or know someone who are applying for graduate school, you can check out our program on our website. Okay, so let's get to the science. So we now know that our genomic DNA is highly spatially organized at different spatial scales. And a lot of what we know about the 3D genome structure is learned from high throughput sequencing techniques such as HiC, which basically you fix the genome and genomic DNA, and then you digest and cut the genome into pieces, and then relight it those fragments that are close to each other um, together. And then we can sequence to detect what are the genomic DNAs that are in close contact with each other. So with this technique, we can obtain information about how frequent two genomic DNAs are like it is so that we know that there, we can infer their spatial proximity in the 3D space. So we summarize the information from those high C techniques, we get those matrices like this, where each coordinate, both X axis and Y axis represent genomic positions. And the intensity here represents the intensity of contact or interactions, and the diagonals represent interactions with itself, and off diagonal represents the interactions between two different genomic positions. And if we look in different spatial scales, for example, the first matrix here represents only a half megabase pair window, and in smaller scale, we see those individual contact. And if we zoom out, we see um, those topologically associated domains, which are regions that range from roughly 50 kV to up to one megabase pair that are um, forming those domains where genomic DNA within its the same domain tend to interact with each other, but not between different domains. And there are also nested structures in those topologically associated domains or tags. And if we zoom even further out at beyond one megabit scale, the most prominent structure now becomes those checkerboard or plate-like structure. So those represent the chromatin compartment. And we can roughly divide the genome into two different compartments, the A compartment and B compartment, where I try to label it by the two colors here. And the genomic in the same compartment tend to interact with the other sequences in the, in the same compartment, but not with the other compartment. And the compartment A tend to be active genes, and compartment B tend to be depleted of active genes. And so as we know that all of those um, structure, like everything in biology, is a structure is highly relevant to its function. So we know that the genomic um, genome 3D structure is relevant for the control of gene expression regulation and DNA replication and also DNA repair. And we also know that these phenomena are highly genomic position specific, so that every different genomic location you see different 3D genome structure, and we expect them to be strongly dependent on the genomic sequence. Um, but we, our understanding to how those 3D genome structure is dependent on the genomic sequence is still quite incomplete. For example, we do know that the topological social domain boundaries are strongly dependent on the CDCF, but we know much less about other types of genome structures, uh, for example, polycommediate context of those chromatin compartments. Right? So we want to approach the question of uh, understanding the sequence dependency of the 3D genome structure with a machine learning based approach. So what we want to do is simply that we start from the genomic sequence and use that as input and we want to be able to predict the multi-scale 3D genome structure. 
And when we test the model, we can give it sequence that it has never seen before. For example, we hold out the chromosome from training and see whether you can accurately predict those 3D genome structure at the current scale. So the setup is simple enough, but there are still challenges in figuring out what's uh, the right model that can do this kind of modeling. So prior to our work, there have been excellent works, including Akita and DeepSea, which can predict the 3D genome structure at up to one megabit pair scale from the genomic sequence. But it's still a challenge to be able to model at all those different scales, including the larger spatial scales that allow us to, to clearly see the chromatin apartments. So we're trying to address this here. And of course, there are some computational challenges. So one of it is, of course, that the input for a whole chromosome that we want to model is very large. So one chromosome can be more than 100 bits pair, sorry, more than 100 fold larger than one megabit pair, which was previously possible. And also the high C of those genome interaction matrices for an entire chromosome can be extremely large, right? So we have to deal with these challenges. And so this is what we do to, to be, allow this uh, modeling. So the, the main idea is that we take a multi-scale modeling design. So it starts from the observation that we don't have to model the um, genome interactions all at the same resolution. So for example, if we're looking at very long range interactions, we cannot measure them in very high resolution. So it's okay to just represent them with the lower resolution. So we represent the uh, largest um, window size um, for the longest range with a lower resolution, and then we can iterate we zoom in into our region of interest. And with smaller window size, we, we use a higher resolution. So then when we zoom into our position of interest, we use the highest resolution. So this is kind of like a Google map style approach where we iteratively zoom into our position of interest. So also our position of interest doesn't have to be at the center. It is in this example, but we can also use this model to zoom into other positions along the diagonal. So this allows us to um, model the short range interactions with high resolution and those longer range interactions with lower res resolution, which controls the size of the of the problem that we're trying to um, deal with. So to pair with this multi-scale prediction, we generate a series of sequence representations using um, convolutional neural network with pooling so that at each level we have a sequence representation at a different resolution. So we start from the raw sequence, the ATGCs, and at a lower level, one value here is computed from um, a smaller chunk of DNA, for example, four kilobits per DNA is um, condensed into one column here, whereas in higher layers, uh, higher levels, one value is computed from a much larger window size, up to one megabit per. So that we have those hierarchy of sequence representations that have different resolution, and we can start from there and make the predictions at the corresponding level. So at the top level, we actually make prediction for the entire sequence that we use as input. Um, so it can be up to 256 megabits here. And this gives us the prediction for the entire region at the lowest resolution. So then we iteratively zoom into a sub-region, um, actually half of the size of the largest window and also twice um, the resolution. So actually uh, it will be, um, if we have like one megabit per resolution here, it will be half a megabit per resolution. And then we zoom into smaller and smaller regions with higher and higher resolution up to four kilobits per resolution at the bottom level. So the model does this computation in this order, we start from the sequence and we go bottom up to generate um, lower and lower resolution 
uh, representations, and then we start to make the prediction from the largest window, and then we iteratively zoom into the smaller and smaller windows. And each um, final scale predictions also take input from the larger, uh, its upper level prediction, so that the information from a larger window is also incorporated into the lower level prediction. So now we have the architecture, but we are still not able to train this model just because of the um, the size of the input is so large that the standard uh, techniques for training just won't work. It will run out of memory even for today's um, GPU. So what do we do? Um, so this is a representation of a standard execution of deep learning models. That this will be a default. If you write a convolutional neural network in any current deep learning libraries, so we'll when you train or make predictions, we will try to um, make the execution um, layer by layer. So you will compute the new layers um, representation at a time. And if it's a hierarchical model, the representations will generally be quite um, heavy on the bottom level because you have a high spatial dimension. And the higher level, um, because of the the representation is small cost screen will have uh, will require less memory. Um, so in this standard execution, which is layer wise, um, and it will store also all the representations at different layers in memory, so that all of those information <coughs> need to be saved in the GPU memory for being able to be used again in the backward uh, back propagation, and this will require a lot of memory. So especially the lower level representations will consume a lot of GPU memory, and it's just infeasible if we want to really um, use it model very large sequence size that's up to the whole chromosome at this case. So there have been techniques for uh, decreasing the memory usage in training um, deep learning models. So one of the idea is checkpointing, which was originally designed for training very deep neural networks with many, many layers. So the idea is that we can execute the, the model in blocks. So we have a block of layers, and then we only store the representation of the output of that block. And all the internal representations of the block is not stored. And those internal representations can be recomputed from the input to the block when needed in the backward pass. But that is still not um, enough for our application because um, of this hierarchical structure and the large input. The first block requires the most memory, and we cannot even compute the first block, um, even if we use this technique. So uh, the simple tricks that we introduce to allow this computation here is to do the checkpointing, but with a different uh, execution strategy. So we now consider a sort of vertical block, which consists of multiple layers. And this allows us to control the width of this block so that the amount of computation is controllable. And also the output, because of the hierarchical structure, the output will be much, much smaller than the input um, of this block. So that we can store the, uh, the output of this block, which, is, um, which needs very little memory. So now we can execute this model horizontally from left to right in this example. And because we can select the appropriate uh, block size, it's easy to control the, the size of the memory that is needed and actually allows us to, to do the training. So with, we can now train the models. So we have trained the models on um, the whole genome except for the holdout chromosomes. And then we can make predictions on the holdout chromosome. So this sequence, the model have not seen during training and the top row shows you the predicted 3D genome structure from the holdout chromosome. So it is for a 32 megabits per region, and the prediction is shown here, and then we iteratively zoom into a sub-region of that region uh, shown in the, on the right, and 
we just gradually zoom into the finest scale, which shows you a uh, one megabase pair uh, region. So we see that we the model predicted different um, at different scales. It captures different types of genome structure. Like in the lower scales, we see most clearly those um, TAT structure, and at the higher levels, we can see more of the chromatin compartment structure, and this matches very well with the um, experimental measurement. And we can also um, lo now look at up to the entire chromosome scale. So the previous slide show you to up to 32 megabase pair, and this just to show you that we can actually now incorporate an entire chromosome in, in this model and also predict the entire chromosomal interactions. So with 256 megabase pair, you can actually put the longest human chromosome, chromosome 1, into this window and predict all of them now. So we do a quantitative comparison of the predictions and the experiment, like the scatter plot shown here. You'll see that the, uh, the predictions matches quite well with the uh, experiment at all those different scales. So we can also uh, train models for different cell types. And here it's an example where we train the models for the two different cell types, the embryonic stem cell and the skin fibroblast. And as you can see from the, the, the circles that's highlighted here, that you can also predict the, different, uh, the difference between those two cell types. Like the, the interaction here in the skin fibroblast shows a different interaction pattern compared to the embryonic stem cell. And you see that in this experiment, experiment as well, and it is also predicted by the, by the model. And in addition, one thing that we, we realized that is the model seems to be capturing not just the um, most typical form of interactions, which are CDCF mediated. It also seems to capture other types of interactions, which of, we of course can observe in, in high C type techniques. And in this example, I'm showing you a few examples of polycom mediated interactions where you can see from the histone marks of H3 k 27 trimethylation. And this type of interactions also tend to be cell type specific. So we see this kind of interactions in the H1C cell, but not in the HFF um, skin fibroblast cell. And this is also consistent with the experimental measurement. And this is another example of a different type of interactions, which are the promoter enhancer interactions, where we can see from the um, histone mark of promoter and those Formula marks H3K4 trimethylation and some marks H3K27 saturation and H3K4 monomethylation. So we see those again are highly cell type specific interactions, and the model can capture those cell type specificity um, here as well. So now we have shown that we can make um, those different types of interactions um, <coughs> predictions from the sequence. And, and what is the use of it, right? So we don't want to just be able to uh, recapitulate what we can already measure experimentally. So I think one of the greatest use of those sequence-based models is that, uh, is, I think they are mainly based on that we are able to make predictions for new sequence, right? So if we are given, in principle, any genomic sequence, we can now predict what are the um, 3D genome structures of those genomic sequence. So you know, you have never seen those sequence before, we have never uh, had any experimental measurement for those sequence. So that leads to many applications. So I'll go into two of the uh, areas of application that we explored in this manuscript. So while the first of them is to predict the impact of genomic variants. So with this model, we can in principle predict the effect of any variant just by introducing that variant to the sequence and then make predictions of that sequence. And then we can compare the sequence, the predicted structures of the sequence that carries the variant and those that does not carry the variant. And because we can now predict the very long 
on sequence that's up to an entire chromosome, we can, in principle, uh, model almost any um, large structural variants. So which are also the variants that tend to be ones that have the strongest effect. So we first um, collected all the variants with known effect on the 3D genome, and then we try to um, predict, verify that we can um, recapitulate what has been measured experimentally. So it is known that many um, structural variants have an impact on the 3D genome, and that impact is one of the reasons that it can cause different diseases. So this has been studied previously, and one of the, my favorite example is this, where um, it's work from Stefan Mandel's lab, where they studied several structural variants in the KCNG2 SOX9 region, which lead to different phenotypes. So if we look at the variant of du the duplication variant here, so if we duplicate the genomic region here or here, it leads to sex reversal, which a uh, female to male um, conversion phenotype. While if we duplicate the larger region, which contains this sex reversal region, actually has no phenotype, so which is intriguing. And if we duplicate an even larger region that goes beyond the KCNG2 gene, and yet another phenotype appears, which is Cook's syndrome. So I explained very well um, in their manuscript that why this is happening due to the effect on the 3D genome. So, so now we are uh, trying to recapitulate this from um, the sequence-based prediction. So here it just shows the, the region that we're looking at. Um, the two genes, KCNG2 and SOX9, are located here. And this is the prediction and this is the experiment. So now we're trying to introduce the, the mutation into the sequence and predict its 3D structure. So we first look at the sex reversal duplication, where the minimal range of duplication that causes the disease is about here. So it's expected that this duplicate region contains the regulatory elements that are interacting with SOX9 to cause the disease. So we introduce this duplication, both the longer form and the shorter form of the duplication. We can see that in the mutant, this TED is enlarged, and the duplicated region is now included in a larger TED. And SOX9 is now um, this TED interacting with both the original copy and the new copy, which likely resulted in an expression change. And this is also what was observed experimentally in the example that I'm showing here. It is actually a homologous variant that was introduced in mouse, which has the same, preserved the same um, TED structure if we compare the wild types and the ones that carry the duplication and compare, we see this difference. So it should be noted that in the experimental measurement, there is one limitation that the, uh, because of short wave sequencing, we cannot distinguish the two different copies um, like we can do here, so that the two copies um, of the duplication are actually collapsed. So it's a little harder to interpret, but what is, this is showing is basically that the, this duplicated region is inter, it has increased in interaction in, with the entire tab here, so that this um, duplicated region is included in the larger tab, which is consistent with the, the prediction here. So now it comes to the mystery of why a larger um, duplication actually end up with no phenotype. So you can clearly see that um, when we include a larger duplication that goes beyond the TED boundary here, actually it creates a new TED boundary here. And therefore, if we look at the interaction patterns for SOX9, it is pretty much preserved um, compared to without the duplication, it's still interacting with the same partners in the same TED. So this is also what was shown in the experiment where this duplication is um, just has an increase of interaction with itself and not with the more surrounding regions. So now if we introduce an even larger duplication, if we go beyond the KCNG2 gene, and yet another phenotype appears. And why is that? So if we include a duplication that extends beyond the KCNG2 genes, now we are having two copies of KCNG2 after the duplication. So the other copy of the KCNG2 is now moved here. And 
what is what happens here is that now the TCNG2 is moved into a new tab and is now interacting with those regions that are originally interacting with SOX9. So SOX9 is not affected because of the same mechanism uh, as a no phenotype duplication where it is still where it is insulated um, from this tab, but KCNG2 is now interacting with those regions that are originally interacting with SOX9. And it can be also shown experimentally that see now the KCNG2 is having um, the same expression pattern compared to the SOX9, which is likely a result of hijacking the, the enhancers that originally regulate SOX9. So in this example that we show that we can recapitulate the experimentally measured structural variance, and we actually have also have a lot of other um, comparisons for the um, all the different structural variants that we we collected, and I cannot see this for most of my models, but for this model, actually, it is um, actually agreeing with every single case that we have tested, so that it is actually something that I think is um, is very usable when it you have a structural variant of unknown impact to the 3D genome. And I think the model can give a pretty um, good um, predictions of how the, the structural variant might impact the 3D genome. So skip over this example, which is just another um, example of structural variant as a same similar story to focus on another part of application that I <coughs> really would like to talk about. So um, while well, the main motivation, as I said um, before, is that we try to um, we want to understand the um, principles that guide the sequence-based organization of the 3D genome. So what are the sequences that, that are important for the 3D genome organization and what, what can we learn from it? So now that the model can quite accurately capture the 3D genome um, structure, just predicting from the sequence alone, and we think that it must have captured things that we um, have not understood before. And we want to extract what are the um, information um, in the model that can inform us to form new hypotheses about this 3D genome organization. Right? So, so how do we in extract the, the information from the model? So there are many strategies, and the ones I, I tend to think about is to consider the, the model as sort of like a virtual cell, where we can do um, in silico genetic screens with the model. So we can just introduce mutations, a library of mutations into the sequence, and then we can predict what are the impact of those mutations on the 3D genome structure. So then we can interpret the result of the virtual screen, and that also allows us, us to uh, iterate and improve our screen design to ask different questions to and to try to get an answer of what are um, the sequence-based um, potential mechanisms of the 3D genome organization. And so because of it is a virtual screen, and that allows to have very flexible design and to be able to iterate very quickly. So. This is something that we can borrow ideas from the traditional genetics to design those screens, but yet with uh, more flexibilities to do it um, with a, the com computational model. So we now design two, um, I would say, two families of, of screens at different spatial scales at the TED and sub TED scale below one megabase pair. We try to exhaustively screen all 10 base pairs to see what are its impact on the this 3D genome structure. While at the larger scale, the common compartment scale, we have a different uh, segment-based screen strategy, which I'll, I'll talk about why. So at the TED and sub -TED scale, we know that it is strongly dependent on CDCF. We also want to see what are the other potential sequence um, that are affecting the, the 3D genome. So we want to just exhaustively test all the single piece of DNA. So we mutate 10 base pair at a time, just randomly um, replace the 
just replace the 10 base pair with random sequence and see what are its impact on the 3D genome structure within the one meg base pair window, right? So we want to exhaustively test all 10 base pairs, and we also want to test every 10 base pairs at least three times so that, so that we can make sure it's not because that it, the new sequence constitutes a new motif or something. So this is still a lot of computation, even if when this is computational and we have to try to optimize to only make predictions for do the computation for what is needed. Um, so one of the another tricks that we introduce is uh, to do the multi multiplexed um, mutagenesis. So in this case, we introduce not just one mutation into a, a sequence, but rather we introduce 20 10 base pair mutations within uh, one meg base pair sequence. So it's still pretty sparse mutation, and we expect every uh, the effect of 10 base pairs that have an uh, impact on the 3 genome is also very sparse. So therefore, we can easily deconvolve those uh, multiplex um, mutation effects. So an example shown here, this is uh, the, the regular um, mutation effect if we introduce uh, one 10 base pair mutation at a time, and we introduce 10 base, 10, 10 base pair, sorry, 10 to 20 mutations at a time, then of course we see a much higher signal of, of disruption. Um, but we can deconvolve this because we have um, designed those disruptions so that every 10 base pair is disrupted exactly three times uh, in three different sequences. So we can just look at those three sequences that contain this same disruption, but pair with other different disruptions. And simply taking the minimum across all three, that we see that the those deconvolved um, mutation effect is actually highly consistent with the uh, mutation effect with just a single uh, 10 base pair mutation. So we see that having three rounds tend to be a sweet spot, so that, that we do um, three repeats for for every single 10 base pair mutation. So that allows to, to screen rapidly for the, the entire genome for all 10 base pair um, mutations. And now we obtain a track like this, where the, each position um, is a genomic location. And the, the, the signal here is the effect of the 10 base pair disruption at this location. So we can compare it with CDCF binding, and as expected, the, the strongest peaks are all related to, to a CDCF binding site. And if we compare the, the, the positions with the strongest um, mutation effect, such as those with the structural impact um, higher than 0 0.1, we see those positions are mostly enriched in CDCF motifs. And even if we look at those that have a weaker CDCF motif score, we find that it is actually proximal to a CDCF motif score within 200 base pair range to a CDCF binding site. So most of the strongest impact sites are indeed explained by CDCF or CDCF proximal sequences. But if we move on to those regions with most positions with a moderate level of impact, uh, like those here, we see that there are still a lot of sequences that are not on uh, CDCF uh, explained. So what are those sequences? And we, when we look at the enrichment of the motifs, um, the TF motifs on those regions with a moderate level of impact and without CDCF, we find actually very cell type specific, specific enrichment. So in the H1ESC cell, we see that those strong impact sites are enriched in QOF5F1, SOX2, TF motifs. And when we look at the HFF cell type, we see an enrichment of AP1 motifs, which are also um, in agreement with our knowledge about the roles of those um, transcription factors in each cell type. So we look at the motifs um, um, in similar way as previous slides when we do for the CDCF, we see that these um, pof one SOX2 motif have a strong enrichment in, in, in sites with the impact uh, in H1ESC, but now in the HFF cell, uh, similar for the um, AP1 motif have an impact in the HFF cell, but not in the H1ESC cell. 
So this is now a policy that these transition factors might impact the these three genome organizations in a field type specific manner. And this is something that we um, we think will will be interesting for um, to see whether it will, will turn out to be uh, also shown by the experimental approaches. So now it goes to the the I think the last um, topic I want to um, go over for for this talk, which is uh, try to infer the sequence based um, mechanisms of coding compartment formation. So this is also something that we can only do once we can um, make predictions for very large spatial scale. And there are still there are several challenges that need to be resolved to, for being able to do such screens. So one of them is that um, we want to deconvolve the effect of a mutation on the TET level and the effect on the chromatin compartment level. So to do this, um, we use a data set that's cohesin deplete, acutely depleted of cohesin. So it actually very cleanly removes the TET structure but the common apartment structure is preserved. So that because of this, we can actually train a model that only predicts the common apartments, but not the TED. So which allows us to single out the, the effect at the compartment level. And another um, issue if you take the previous screen approach is that if you just mutate the 10 base pair, it actually have almost um, no effect on the chromatin compartment. So we take a different screen strategy where we insert a longer chunk of sequence into different target locations and see whether this insertion um, is actually affecting the chromatin compartment uh, level three genome interaction at those target locations. So this is an example. Um, so in this example, I will show you um, the um, insertion screens at nine different locations in this 32 megabase pair region. So this nine different locations are evenly spaced and covers both uh, A and B compartment. And the saw sequences that we will insert into those target locations are also uh, selected from this 32 megabase pair region. So in this case that every saw sequence is 12.8 um, kilobase pair, about 10 kb. And we'll insert every single of those 10 kb sequence into those uh, each of those target locations. So for each target location, we can visualize the impact of the saw sequence on the 3D structure um, by a profile here, where each non-axis axis it shows the position of the saw sequence, and y-axis shows the effect on the 3D genome. And we can see that those um, saw sequence impact profiles are grouped by target locations. And those locations are with um, that are coming from the um, common compartment B are actually uh, grouped together because they are sensitive to compartment B to compartment A transition. And those target locations that are from the compartment um, a is grouped together because they are sensitive to compartment A to compartment B transition. And we can see that uh, there are different characteristics of sequences for with B to A activity or those with A to B activity, right? So those with B to A activity are sparse and they're mostly coming from the A compartment. And those with A to B activities are a wide spread. So it is everywhere, but more enriched in the B compartment sequences. So we want to look more into what are the sequence that has activity of each of these two kinds. So the first thing that we look at is what are the size of the sequence that's required to change a chromatin compartment. Um, so we in the previous slide, we show you insertions of about 10 KB insertion. And now we are looking at all the different sizes of insertions and from 20 to 200 base pairs all the way up to about 50k. And what can you see is a clear difference here. So the B2A compartment transition can be induced with a very short sequence, even 400 to 800 sequence, um, while the A2B compartment transition requires much larger um, 
much longer um, sequence, and that's starting from about 10 KB um, in length. So this seems to suggest a potentially very different um, mechanisms of the, the A and B compartment formation. And by the way, this scale also happened to be the the scale of the A to B compartment transition also happened to be the scale that is uh, required when you um, want to you, when you cut the genome into pieces and when you want to preserve um, the crumbling compartment, you can cut it up to about 10 kilobasphere fragments, but if you cut it further, then it, the compartment structure starts to dissolve. So this might be a length scale that is um, required for a specific mechanism of the compartment information. Um, and it seems to be in agreement from a computational approach and an experimental approach. So now we want to look into what are the sequences that are such statistic sequences that are able to induce the compartment transition. Right, so if we zoom into those, um, so before we zoom in, we can actually see that we, when comparing with the transcriptional activity um, measured by the cage signal, we see that these um, positions with strong between compartment transition activity is in agreement with the transcriptional activity, um, which also isn't surprising because we know that the a compartment has a strong um, association with transcription arc. <clears throat> with transcription, but we haven't been able to, to test at the sequence level what are the sequences that are responsible for um, <clears throat> the compartment activity. So we zoom into those strongest sites with the compartment activity. Um, compartment A activity, we find that those um, sites actually coincide with the positions of the transcription star site. So in all those strong sites with compartment activity, we find that it is actually centered at a transcription star site. And we compare the sequences with strong and versus weak compartment activity. There is a several orders of magnitude difference in the TSX activity between these two groups of, of sequences. And also this activity seems to be not carrying about the directions of the transcription. So either direction of transcription will do in this case according to the model. So for all those target sites that you see similar level of activity no matter whether the transcription is happening in the positive strand and the negative strand. And lastly we want to see what are the sequence pattern size that's required to for having a compromise activity. For example if a, um, the sequence can be uh, if you require a motif that is of size k, then if we disrupt all the sequence patterns um, below k base pair by randomly permuting those sequence, and we are destroying all of the sequence motifs um, that have size of at least k, right? So if we ha still have the activity after permuting the sequence by those k base pair segments, and that means that this activity is, is not dependent on motif or sequence patterns that are higher, larger than k base pair. So we do this for both compartment A and compartment B um, the activity. And we see that for the compartment A activity, as expected, it does depend on uh, both motif size and even larger um, sequence patterns. So if we disrupt to below 100 base pair, start to affect. Um, very strongly about the, the compartment A activity, and even has some impact if we have a disruption of about 100 base pair. Um, in, in very sharp contrast for the compartment B, it seems to be not caring very much about the disruption, or even have an increase in compartment B activity in some regions if we um, disrupt the sequence by all of those different segment size, even up to two base pair. So this seems to suggest that the compartment B activity may not necessarily need uh, to have a strong, uh, to have a complex sequence pattern. It doesn't mean that this complex sequence pattern cannot induce compartment B, but it may not be necessary for the compartment B activity. And I also see that um, in agreement with previous knowledge, we see that compartment B activity is correlated with the 
AT percentage. So the, the sequences with higher percentage of ATs tend to have stronger um, compartment B activity according to the model. So it seems like the compartment B activity seems to be not dependent on the, the complex sequence patterns, right? So then we try to see whether we can induce compartment B by destroying sequence patterns in compartment A regions. So this is a, a preliminary test where we um, shuffle the sequence in those compartment A regions. And then we actually see that C, if we permute sequence in the compartment A, we see the B compartment-like structure forming. And if we permute sequence in the compartment B, it remains in the B compartment. So it seems like the, according to the model, uh, disruptions of sequence patterns leads to B compartment formation. So taken together, this is a, a, a model that we, we propose about the um, compartment formation, where the compartment A formation is induced by um, even short sequences of TSS, um, which likely induce a widespread change in the, the chromatin and widespread change in chromatin compartment. Um, while the B compartment seems to be generally more dependent on any complex sequence patterns um, beyond the AT content, and it requires uh, extended sequence that's um, about 10 base kilo base pair long to be able to form. So this is what we can infer from the, the, the sequence. And of course, it's due on um, just hypothesis, and I look forward to see whether um, this will turn out to, to be supported by the experiment um, later on. So we have talked about different uh, aspects of applications from the sequence model. I think can be a very useful tool for studying the multi-scale 3 genome organization. So we provide the, the web server. If you want to predict an impact of a struct any structural variant, you can test it here on our web server. and. If you're a computer biologist, you will have the code and models uh, released here in this repo. So that's all, and I would like to thank um, my funding sources and the infrastructure support from BioGPC. That, yeah, I did most of this work um, while I was only one in the lab, as I just mentioned, and I have those lab members, and we're also recruiting. So if you're interested in, in please send me an email. So I'm happy to take any questions. Fabulous, great, great work, Jan. Um, so let's uh, let's open the floor for some uh, questions. Um, uh, so yeah, you can enter your questions in the Q and A, and there are a few questions starting to to flow in. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Jan, can you see the Q and A section? Uh, let me. Turn. Yeah, so I think uh, either I can yeah. read the question or if you want, you can you can read it. Yeah, so I can read this question. So the first question is for interchromosome interchromosome interaction prediction. Have I used any interchromosome data in your training or it is based on the interchromosome? Inter so it is trained based on the both the intrachromosome or interchromosome or interactions. I only train it, we only use um the interchromosome infection from the between the training chromosomes. So yeah, we're not validating it, we're using the interchromosome infections between um, the <clears throat> only the product chromosomes. So any comments on the performance of interchromosome interchromosome, which one has better prediction accuracy? So yeah, this question I don't remember exactly, so but it is definitely in, in the manuscripts that you, you can look up. The second question is that for the cell line specific, do you have any cell line specific input features using the same model or train multiple cell line specific models using different cell lines? So in this case, we train a different model for different cell lines using the cell line specific high C 
data. So one detail that I didn't mention um, in this talk is that we also have an auxiliary task, which we ask the model to predict the cell-specific histone marks and DNAs and CDCF binding, which has uh, it's really helpful for improving uh, the model performance, but it is sufficient to just use a cell type specific high C interaction matrix to train the model, and the model will learn how the different cell types will differentially utilize those sequence. And the third question is that a general question for high C and micro C for the type of compartment related. Prediction with million base pair resolution, do I have any comment on how much I can benefit from using micro C instead of high C, which gives you higher resolution? So the main benefit here is the uh, user resolution. So with the, the micro C data, we're able to make predictions at the higher resolution. So with high C data that's more widely available, you can also train those models. And so if you are interested in um, not the finest details of the, of the of the 3D structure, you can do it with the high C data as well. So you don't have to use micro C data, but it does um, micro C, all the newest version of high C, which has give you higher resolution data, will help when you, we are making predictions at the uh, highest resolution. Yeah, the Magnus question, I think it's the same. Yeah, we can use standard high C um, to train those models for sure. Uh, but just to follow up on that, I expect if you use high C, maybe uh, um, you don't pick up as many uh, interesting regulatory features, right? Uh, does does high C, I mean, does high C have the mm -hmm. same in level of information as micro C? Usually it's primarily CDCF loops and uh, or if you have you if you if you train these models on high C, do you also pick up all the beautiful, you know, like the mm -hmm. the motifs that you saw and the TSS features and all of those aspects, or is it primarily going to give you like structural properties? Yeah, that's a good question. So we haven't looked into very much details on the sequence dependencies of models trained on high C. Mm -hmm. So I cannot. Um, see for sure whether it does, um, but I think HiSea does capture some of those other types of, of interactions as well, despite yes. at a, a lower resolution, but it is indeed something that requires a more careful look at the models trained on HiSea, yes. That's great. I mean, yeah, if this, if this, yeah. if this actually worked on current generation HiSea, that would be quite spectacular. Uh, I mean, it definitely would work. I'm saying whether it would it would yeah whether it captures the regulatory signal of features as micro C that would be really spectacular. So. Right. There's another question now from Abigail. Yeah. 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 Abigail has the question of uh, when can we tell uh, content that shows that two regions are physically close, like on the same chromosome versus when they have counting interactions like discussed here. Oh, so we are seeing whether two regions are physically close because we know which regions the contact is coming from, right? So we know that if they are close to adjacent to each other on the chromosome, right? So if there are the two regions are far away from each other on the chromosome, um, but they still interact, then we know that they likely have some kind of a chromatin loop or interactions. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. And Magnus has a question whether a model that predicts high C, micro C from high C is compensated for some of the lost resolution. So that is an interesting question. So whether it's possible to utilize information in high C and maybe have a model that tries to um, improve the resolution of high C by using information that's coming from high C. So I think that's an interesting potential, but it does depend on that the Mac IC still ultimately need to contain this information, right? Even though it may not be um, apparent by visualizing 
the matrix is still need to contain this fine scale information so that a model can predict from high C the finer um, scale factors when trained with higher resolution data. So, so that's yeah, that's definitely an interesting question for, for future um, research. Great, awesome. Those are those are excellent questions. Um, <clears throat> I guess I, I'll just ask one last one, John. Um, mm -hmm. So the models look incredibly uh, great. Uh, I guess my question is, uh, where can we improve, right? Particularly on this problem, right? right? Like, is this is this really maxing out? Um, you know, what you can pull out of these, or is there still room? And and what is required? Is it better data? Is it bigger models? Is it better training? Is it different architectures? Like, where do you think the big big uh, gaps remain for for this kind of uh, 3D structure? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the model is still not yet perfect. So if you look at all the model predictions, um, in some of the cases, we are still off, especially at the chromatin compartment scale. So it is. Uh, in some of the surrounding regions, our predictions is is totally wrong <laughs> compared to the actual observation. So I think there is still space for improvement, especially at the compartment scale. So I think that is also a more complex thing to model because we do know that the compartment is dependent on the transcription. So we probably really need to have a accurate transcription model to be able to model the coming compartment fully accurately. So that might be what is needed to fully um, accurately predict the coming compartment. So you might need to have a joint prediction between transcription and the, the coming compartment. That's my that's my thought. Awesome. And one just one quick suggestion for you. Um, the new the new T two T genome just came out and there's mm -hmm huge regions of uh, uh, that that previously haven't been available and also it's very hard to map short reads there i'm very curious what your models would do in those regions like you could potentially impute uh, you know 3d contacts uh, in in those repetitive regions where it's very hard to get short reads uh, to really yeah that's a re really interesting question exactly i wrong i right so with the t2d like Chromosome come out. I just immediately run a prediction on the whole chromosome. That's great. Yeah. The trouble is, I still don't know how accurate it is, right? So because we don't have, the, as you said, we don't have the data for it. I have the prediction, but I'm not confident to say that what, what is predicted is is actually accurate. I think we don't know yet. So especially for repetitive regions, because we have so little data, the model kind of extrapolates from what is known. But whether extrapolation is reliable, we're not sure. So, but. It will be, of course, it will be something that, that will be interesting to look, look further. Yeah. Cool, cool. Awesome. Great.